There are some jobs in this world that were just made for the Soviet Union to excel at, such as being a high-quality arch-nemesis to the United States, chucking things into space, building a massive stockpile of nuclear weapons, cooking some absolutely banging borscht, and perhaps most of all, churning up ideas for new and deadly superweapons. From the T-42 Super Heavy Tank to the Fractional Orbital Bombardment System to the handheld laser pistol, the Soviets were masters at drawing up weapon systems that could send the West into a panic while reassuring the party that its best days were still ahead. And speaking of which, it's time that we talk about the Mil V-12, which had a length of 37 meters and a wingspan of 67 meters from rotor tip to rotor tip and a maximum takeoff weight of over 100,000 kilograms, still holds the record as the largest helicopter the world has ever seen. When the V-12 burst onto the international scene in 1971, it had NATO quaking in its boots. But within just three years, the project had been condemned in full to the Soviet trash heap. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the groundbreaking design of the Mil V-12 and the accumulation of roadblocks and hurdles that kept the chopper firmly on the ground forever. The origins of the V-12, like the origins of most Cold War-era engineering advancements, were ultimately about nuclear weapons. While the Soviet Union had no shortage of nuclear weapons or the intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs, that would fire them, it did have a logistical problem, which was how exactly they'd get those ICBMs to a launch pad without the Americans finding them. While we won't be getting into the specifics of nuclear deterrence in today's video, suffice it to say that it's important for a nuclear arms nation to keep the location of its ready-to-launch weapons either secret or extremely well protected just in case another nuclear armed nation were to suddenly launch a nuclear strike on them. If Nation A wants to launch its nuclear weapons at Nation B, but Nation B has its own hidden nuclear weapons aimed at Nation A, then there probably won't be a nuclear exchange because both sides risk destruction by launching their ICBMs. But if Nation A knows where Nation B hides its missiles, Nation A can bomb those sites first, thus taking out Nation B's ability to retaliate, and with it, Nation B's best hope of convincing Nation A not to attack in the first place. As a result of this fine balance, both the US let's say Nation A and the Soviet Union, they should be, spent the Cold War hard at work trying to figure out each other's ICBM launch sites while keeping their own hidden. Uh, we now know, in hindsight, that neither side was particularly enthusiastic about launching a full-scale nuclear assault just because they could, but each side still wanted the security of knowing that they could end a conflict decisively if a launch from the other side appeared imminent. This meant that the Soviets were constantly dealing with American U-2 spy planes trying to get a full inventory of where Soviet missiles were located. The annoying thing about ICBMs, particularly their earlier variants, is how much of a pain in the ass they are to transport. This was an issue for the Soviets in particular because of the remoteness of many of their strategic locations for launch sites that the Soviets could use to fire ICBMs over the Arctic towards the continental US. With no roads or landing strips in those areas, the only way to actually get an ICBM to the necessary location was to send it by train. But those train tracks would draw a line right to the launch sites. Soviet infrastructure did not rely on rail transport in general, meaning that any new railroads that the American U-2s observed would both stick out like a sore thumb and lead directly to the site of a launch facility. Obviously, that was going to be a problem, and a new road or airstrip large enough to facilitate transport of ICBMs would also not be great. But a helipad? Well, that could be concealed much more easily, as any kind of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft requires far less space to touch down. If a Soviet helicopter existed that was large enough to fit an ICBM, it could very well solve the transport issues their ICBMs were causing and ensure the international order of mutually assured destruction could continue being upheld. Brilliant. For party leadership, there was one place to go in order to get this done. The Mill Design Bureau of the Moscow Helicopter Plant, headquartered in the town of Tomolino in Russia. 
Mill had already entrenched themselves as the Soviet go-to for all things helicopters and had just introduced the Mi-6 helicopter design, both the world's largest helicopter at the time and a successful one during its years supporting the Soviet armed forces. The Mi-6 had broken a number of world records when it began service and the Soviet's new helicopter would need to break them all again. Mill's new design would have to be able to lift some 20 to 25 tons of weight plus its own mass in long-haul flights across the Soviet Union. This was enough capacity to hold three kinds of ICBM, or just as usefully, a large amount of conventional weaponry and supplies. But balancing this kind of weight in the long tube-like shape of a missile would be impossible in a helicopter with one top rotor. After all, helicopters are hard to keep stable, even at the best of times, and a 100-foot-long craft really shouldn't rely on one little tail rotor. Plus, a single rotor wouldn't generate enough lift to get the thing off the ground in the first place. Also a problem. The Soviets explored a tandem rotor system like the United States used on their Chinook helicopters, but these had their own problems, and eventually the engineers in charge gave up on that idea. The concept they came to instead was a so-called traverse layout. Two equal-sized rotors on either of the support wings, which were believed to give enough stability that the helicopter could at least maintain safe flight. The modern Bell Boeing V-22 Osprey actually uses this very same concept. The mill design would have a massive rotor span from tip to tip, almost 220 feet or 67 meters. It would be powered by four D-25 engines of 6,500 horsepower each. This design blew Soviet expectations out of the water in terms of carrying capacity. In addition to its own weight, this unit could get some 40 or more tons off the ground. The rest of the helicopter took shape around those two traverse motors, with a freight compartment 28 meters long and 4.5 and meters tall and wide. To give you an idea of its size, this chamber was more than large enough to hold a city bus and it had a carrying capacity of 196 passengers, meaning that just two of the helicopters could conceivably carry an entire Soviet battalion into battle. The chopper was crewed by six operators, a pilot, a co-pilot, a flight engineer, a navigator, a radio operator, and a dedicated electrician. It used a two-cockpit design with the navigator and radio operator in the upper section and everybody else down below. The back end of the helicopter opened up with two massive doors, clamshell style, and it was fitted out to carry payloads underneath, even if something couldn't fit inside. The V-12, as it would eventually be dubbed, could at a top speed of 260 km per hour with a range of 500 km, or double that if it only had to make a one-way trip. The first prototype of the V-12 was finished in 1968, eight years after the design was produced. Its first test flight, just a few months prior, had not gone well at all, because as the pilots had found out the hard way, the helicopter had a tendency to shake so hard that everybody on board risked losing their lunch. They also risked in-flight accidents, like for example causing involuntary rolls, which is well, actually precisely what happened. The first test flight ended with the V-12 smashing into the ground and popping its own tires. This might not have been much of a problem on its own. After all, tires come cheap when you've got the R&D budget of a global superpower. But unfortunately, the government had gotten ahead of themselves, hyping up their new supercopter for Western audiences, and a relatively minor accident turned into a bit of a major black eye. After a year of repairs and modifications, the newer, better version of the V-12 was ready to fly again, with a lot less fanfare than before. This time, the chopper successfully flew from its pad at the mill factory to a testing facility, and now that it could be trusted to get off the ground, it started to blow even its operators away with just how much it could handle. Before long, the V-12 had broken eight world records for carrying massive amounts of cargo and getting them above certain altitudes. In fact, it still holds four of those records today. The prototype and a second helicopter delivered shortly afterward were lauded around the world, including being awarded the prestigious Sikorsky Prize by the American Helicopter Society, and its design was patented around the world. The memories of its first flight were all but erased, and the V-12 turned into such a press victory for the Soviet Union that even the US and its allies couldn't help but applaud. Western militaries flew into a panic, trying to figure out what the V-12 was for and how the Soviets had managed to build a helicopter that was so damn big. Its crowning moment came at the Paris Air Show in 1971, and since there was no way to get the V-12 there unless it flew itself, the Soviets took full advantage with an air tour over several major European cities.
And now we still don't actually know just how much the Soviet Union spent to put the V-12 in the skies. But whatever the final figure was, it wouldn't be worth the cost just because the helicopter had made some American generals have nightmares. No. This helicopter was built to fly, and fly it would. Except, well, fly it actually would. The leaders of the Soviet Union didn't tell the world, but privately they'd realized that the V-12 design was doomed even before they'd received the second prototype. The reason was simple. Those pesky U-2 spy planes we mentioned before were no longer the only eyes in the sky that the Soviets had to contend with. The era of spy satellites had begun, and while individual planes could only take images of fairly small patches of land each time they flew over, the satellites could image millions of square miles at a time and send that data right back to the United States. The days of scattershot intelligence flights had passed, and missile launch sites could no longer be hidden just by putting them in the middle of nowhere. Even if the Americans previously thought those areas too low priority to examine, while well, the satellites could examine them with no problem. Of course, this advancement worked both ways. The Americans would see the Soviet launch sites, and the Soviets could see the American ones. But the V-12 quickly became one of satellite technology's confirmed kills, as there was no need any longer to haul around ICBMs by air. And the helicopter didn't serve much practical use anywhere else either. If it were to be used in a war zone, then sure, carrying 200 troops around sounded pretty cool, but shoot down one V-12 and the enemy takes out half a Soviet battalion riding inside it. The same went for cargo, and if cargo had to be airlifted for non-combat purposes, then, well, why not just use a plane? The situations in which a V-12's vertical takeoff and landing capability was truly needed for an amount of cargo that couldn't just be split between multiple smaller helicopters were extremely limited, and they certainly didn't justify the cost. The Soviet Air Force outright refused to accept the helicopter designed for trials, and although the Mill Design Bureau continued to work on the project for a little while, the entire thing was mothballed by 1974. Of the two prototypes that were built, one was kept at Mills Helicopter Plant, while the other was donated to an Air Force Museum near Moscow to be displayed to the public. An anticipated second version of the craft, meant to carry even heavier loads, was also cancelled. Mill briefly entertained the possibility of making a variant for commercial use in Siberia, but again, there just wasn't a need for a helicopter of the V-12 size. If there's any small victory that the V-12 achieved, it might have been by getting the Americans to waste some of their own R&D budget trying to build a competitor aircraft, but, well, that's about all the helicopter ultimately achieved. Today, the V-12 lives on exclusively through the records it set and the prototypes that continued to capture the public's imagination. It's a testament to the V-12's incredible feats of engineering and its obsolescence that many of its records stay unbeaten today. And with no known aircraft currently in deployment that would come even close to the V-12's lifting capacity, it'll probably continue to hold those records for a really long time. Its successor craft, most prominently the Mil Mi-26, have given the V-12 no reason to step out of retirement. And in all likelihood, the V-12 will remain the world's greatest helicopter that never really was.